All right, lads and ladettes, we're going to do a review of the balance beam and relativity of simultaneity situation. So earlier last week, Michael Toon emailed me and said, Alan, I'm doing a 50 hour fundraiser trip for Antarctica. I can science that is coming over to cover the Einstein's train. This will be at 1 a.m. Central Time on October 12th. I know it's a strange time, but if you're interested, you're invited to join me. Well, thank you for the invitation. So here's what I replied with. I appreciate your invitation and chance to defend myself live. However, I won't be attending anything that supports you directly. If I can science that once to discuss it, I have several debate challenges that can be found here, and I provided a link there. And make sure he covers this as well, because I made an update to the train situation, right? Because in the debate I had with Mord Juan and Peter, I used a bomb and a train situation, and Peter didn't know the answer offhand, so he, you know, got got real emotional about it. But the answer is the ambiguity with the midpoint of the train and the time it takes for the signal to reach the midpoint. And you could philosophically argue that, oh, well, how could the observer know that the event, you know, it really happens in reality simultaneously, et cetera, et cetera, right? And we'll come back to that here in a second. But that's just in reference to the bomb and the train and why it's important to cover the balance beam because the modification to this argument, which I'll read as follows. The bomb and train has ambiguity regarding it regarding the time it takes for C to travel and the train no longer being at the midpoint. This ambiguity is a distraction from the resultant divergent physical outcome that must follow. But fair enough, as they say. This was corrected in the following scenario that removes the ambiguity and provides a citation from Einstein arguing different physical outcomes are mandatory. Some relativists have tried to answer this paradox by pronouncing that the that an outcome in both frames uh, will agree upon the simultaneous event. This answer implies absolute time and space, which is the incorrect interpretation as stated by Einstein and modern academia. And I gave a citation here uh, titled the challenge, the challenge of changing deeply held student beliefs about relativity of simultaneity, because most students while they go through the mathematical processes of solving uh, relativistic equations and solutions, they hold on to the concept of absolute simultaneity and they don't realize that uh, relativity of simultaneity does not imply absolute simultaneity. So in other words, if the two frames, the moving frame and the stationary frame agree, then that establishes an absolute timeline, an absolute time and absolute space. And that is not what Einstein put forward. And we'll come back to that here in a second. And then I provided a link to my presentation that I had with Mordwand and Peter, where you can run down the new, uh, I'm sorry, get the citation for Einstein's direct quote on that. I should have that up actually. One second. Uh, what would it be? Obsidian. Obsidian. Presentation. Debate presentation. So right here we have Einstein in 1920 stating that are two events like two strokes of lightning, A and B, which are simultaneous with reference to a railway embankment, also simultaneous relative to a moving train. We shall directly show that the answer must be in the negative. Oh, no way. So physically different outcome for the simultaneous event, right? Just to be clear here, that's what that means. When saying that lightning strokes at A and B are simultaneous with respect to the embankment, we mean that the ray of light emitted at the places A and B where the lightning occurs meet each other at the midpoint of the train length between A and B of the, of the embankment. But the events A and B also correspond to the positions A and B on the train. Let M1 be the midpoint of the distance between A and B on the moving train. Just as just when the flashes, as judged from the embankment, occur, the midpoint in M1 naturally coincides with M, which would be a, at the other midpoint, the intersection point of the two simultaneous events for the stationary observer at the embankment. 
but it moves towards the right of the diagram with the velocity v of the train. If the observer sitting at M1 in the train does not possess this velocity, he would remain permanently at M and the rays of light emitted at A and B would reach him simultaneously, i.e. they would meet just as they were situated. Now, in reality, consider the reference frame of the railway embankment. He is hastening towards the beam of light coming from B whilst he is riding ahead of the beam coming from A. Hence, the observer will see the beams emitted from B earlier than he will see them emitted from A. Observers who take the railway train as their frame of reference must therefore come to the conclusion that the lightning flash B took place earlier than the lightning flash A. Thus, we arrive at this important result. Events which are simultaneous with reference to the embankment are not simultaneous with respect to the train, and vice versa. Oh, no way then this is called relativity of simultaneity. Every reference body coordinate system has its own particular time. Oh, no way. So they're not connected by absolute time and space. Okay, got it. Unless we are told the reference body to which the statement of time refers, there is no meaning to the statement of time of an event. Hmm. Okay, interesting. So my interpretation is supported by Einstein. So let's keep reading here. Oops. I just wanted to show real quick the timestamps. So Tune sent this to me on the 6th. And I replied, let's see, a little bit later that day. And then I sent, I can science that an email the following day. Um, I sent I sent one to the wrong address at first. And then second, uh, second time I got it. But anyway, so these guys had full time to prepare for everything, full time to answer all this. This isn't, you know, some crazy stuff they'd never heard of before, right? But let's continue on. So there's my citation. And then this citation here, the challenging deeply held beliefs, that's um, a critique that some professors put together, like a study they were doing. You know, they basically quizzed their students and undergraduates and stuff on relativity to see if they understood what relativity of simultaneity actually means. And most of them did not. They all held the belief that time and space are absolute, which is antithetical to relativity theory. Okay, so now that we've established that, let's go back here. He can skip to the relevant parts by control Fing the citation here. And I gave the title so he can pull this up exactly right here and read it for himself. And then also look it up, you know, in uh, Google Scholar or what have you. And then additionally, here's a letter from, from Lorentz to Einstein, which he never replied as far as I could find in the records inquiring about absolute time and space since the physical consequences of relativity of simultaneity are never physically manifested. And there's the... Uh, the link there, what was that from? The Ether Prez, Ether Physics Prez. Pull that up real quick. Uh, yeah, right here. Oops. So right here, Lorenz is talking about a universal spirit without being tied to some specific place that permeate, permeates the entire system of everything under consideration, blah, 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 because uh, he's coming, he's, he's basically philosophically um, came to the conclusion that there has to be some underlying thing that's keeping track of all these events and keeping their proper order um, because there's no relativity of simultaneity to be manifested. So I gave him the citations for that as well. So he could look up that where Lorenz wrote, wrote to Einstein inquiring about the same thing. And I told Toon, and I can science that specifically, you may have, you have my permission to share this email communication in full as a preference to preference ugh, preface to the explanation. And I implore you to do so. And the reason I did this was because I watched a video of McToon a couple of weeks back where he was going to have Robert Bennett on to discuss geocentrism. And this uh, conversation was set up by a third party who was going to join the conversation as well. And McToon pulled up that guy's entire discord conversation with him and just started reading it from the chat to embarrass him and all these things. So I'm like, okay, dude, you want to be, let's just put it all on the record. That way, if you do that to me, I can't be like, Oh no, you shared my private messages. No, no, please share them with the full context. Right? So this is the full context of what I sent these two gentlemen. And they had ample time to address and prepare for this. So let's see how they respond. So keep in mind here, we're about to 
Uh, I'm going to skip through a little bit here. So basically what we already covered as Icon Science is that main point is that uh, it's, it's the midpoint argument, which I already addressed, which is a distraction from the divergent physical outcomes that must occur, as stated by Einstein in plain English. So anyway, he's going through talking about the midpoint and whatever. And then here's our boy, Dr. Blitz. Shout out to Dr. Blitz. He does. He wasn't. I, I wasn't aware that he was going to be here for this. So I didn't send him any email communications. He's currently off the hook. You're you're fine. You're not going to catch any strays on this one, Dr. B. But uh, that is an open debate challenge. So if you ever want to defend relativity theory, you know where to find me. All right. Exactly. So here we're going to play Icon Sciences that's analysis on the train situation. So here we go. He doesn't think I get it. Oh, okay, that's okay. weird. Okay, so um, I, I got a little time card on here because I don't think he gets it. Um, hmm. He seems to sort of get it. He seems to understand that his original presentation was in error, but you know, like, like as a teacher, when I look at this, I'm looking for signs that he truly understands the material, not just that he's accepting that he was wrong. And I don't really get that feeling. So you all watch this with me. Students hate him. The perceived event will happen, will occur in a different order than for the stationary observer. Now, this is an apparent effect. In reality, lightning stroke, light, lightning strike, stroke or strike, who knows? Lightning strike, both of these uh, A and B points at the same time for the uh, stationary observer. And that's the event that occurred in reality, right? Now, the perceived motion of the train, or I'm sorry, the observer on the train who's moving perceives the events occurring differently. But that doesn't change the fact that the event actually happened um, in reality simultaneously. Okay, so... Oh, no way. What? Dude, what? What was I pulling up right before you, you axed me out, bro? What was I pulling um, up? What's this next? What's that next page? Oh, that looks really familiar. What was that page? Was that was that this page? Oh, yeah. Where I was quoting from Einstein to support my argument, which is correct. The way that I'm interpreting it, the way that Einstein interpreted it, you just saw him cut it off directly from that. Okay, well let's keep going. Let's see what these guys have to say. Okay, so I'm pause it there. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think he got it because he still, hmm. still seems to be saying that um, only one of the observers is seeing reality and the other one is seeing some kind of illusion. Um, and so I want to emphasize again that any inertial observer is equally valid. There's nothing to say that one person's point of view is right and another one's is wrong. <laughs> If they're both equally valid and they both agree on the same re simultaneous event, regardless of their velocity, then guess what, buddy? Time and space are absolute. I, <laughs> dude, this is so crazy. Like, the trouble with this with the thought experiment is that it relies on like the way that we see it. But there's a, there's such an easier way to do this. Take your train. On, make sure that the train is exactly is exactly long enough so that it fits between both trees, which is tricky to do in relativity, by the way. But you know, make sure you account for length contraction and these things. So that um, right. the time. Have it marked down the time. Or in one of the frames, something about the time. Yeah, oh, back to moment. The time is wrong, um, and you all can watch this with me. The example given here. Now, oh, that's weird. What's he doing? He's cutting back to the intro earlier in the video. Where Oh, wait, is this the earlier part? I can't remember. Or was it slightly after? Oh, it was slightly. So he cuts, dude, it was after that. He cuts out my part. <laughs> and then includes the follow-up, bro. You, that's sickening. That's actually sickening to act like I didn't know what I was talking about. I don't think he's getting it, buddy. The fact that you did this shows not only do I get it, you're afraid. You couldn't let everyone hear what Einstein actually said is happening because you can't defend it. Nobody could. Lorenz couldn't do it. That's why he was starting to have second doubts about it and wrote Einstein about the uh, the philosophical implications, saying, is there some worldly spirit that, you know, is keeping track of all these events? Dude, so sad. Let's continue. Given here with the lightning strikes and the bomb reaching the midpoint. Sure, sure. There's a there's an apparent effect which you would not perceive the event as being simultaneous. But did the event occur in reality simultaneously for both observers, regardless of the apparent effect now when you get into the bomb situation in the train they can argue the, the, mid the midpoint difference blah 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 okay fair enough fair enough touche blah, blah, blah. I... oh word you're gonna you're gonna cut off my truncated explanation to get away from the ambiguity and get right to the 
to the actual point of it, right? That there is that relativity demands different physical outcomes for the observers. You're going to hit me with a little cartoon meme. Cool, man. I don't say that was a good use. That was a great use of your time. Very educational for the audience. Now everyone knows exactly what Einstein didn't write about because you denied them because you can't defend it live. Anyway, when I'm not even there, by the way. All right, here we go. Okay, so um, hand waving the blah, blah, blah bit. Uh not a hand wave, bro. Completely addressed it. Notes it as ambiguity because it, it distracts from the uh, actual events being simultaneous in reality for both observers, regardless of the apparent effect that one event appeared to happen first. Uh, I don't... I don't count that. At, whoa! I don't count that as um, any indication that he really understood. I don't think blah blah hmm. blah counts as hmm. I understood this material. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so um, last but not least, um, Alan's going to fix the problem. Hmm. He recognizes that, that he had something wrong with his problem, and he's going to redo this by getting rid of all the, the light, getting rid of all the lightning, and replacing them with a balance beam. So if you all are watching and you're thinking this is uh, this is actually another common misconception, I, I'm picking on Alan here, and sorry about that, but. Oh, no, no. You're picking on me because you can't defend this properly. And you have to now make it appear that I was so incompetent and wrong that that your explanation is definitely the right one to go with. Um, a lot of people make this mistake. You're not sorry. You're sad and weak. You see this mistake online a lot uh, from people who haven't really. No mistake from me, bro. Literally quoted Einstein. Studied this. And they, they make this mistake. You'll see if we can find the mistake in his balance beam. Hmm. Let's take another example, right? So here we have balls A and B, and they're being held by a platform that will release it, that will uh, drop out from under A and B at the same time. When the, when observers, when the moving observer and the stationary observer intersect, stationary and the stationary observer will see these two balls A and B fall, and they'll hit a balance beam um, at points A one and points B one. Oops. I gave away the answer. <laughs> I get where the answer. Um, his balance beam. He's imagining that uh, that a ball hitting. Whoops, I'm not in PowerPoint anymore. A uh, ball hitting at this point would cause this balance beam to tilt. The entire balance beam would tilt, and it would deflect the other end of the balance beam upwards instantaneously. He's imagining that this happens. Oh yeah. Instantly, because that's that's how we think of rigid physical materials, yeah. right? We think of them as being rigid. I mean, all of our hmm. physics problems in classical physics are all based on these idealized rigid bodies like this, right? Um, so again, very excusable mistake, very common mistake. But ultimately hmm. what he has done is he has communicated this impact at point B1. This, the fact that it hits at B1, that data is being sent over here to point A1 instantaneously, Instantly, yep. faster than the speed of light. And if you go faster than the speed of light, you can violate causality which is exactly what he has done here. Yeah. So mm, great if analysis. He has some kind of hypothetical way to send the fact that the ball hit here over to this other point instantaneously, we could in fact build a time machine and go back and find the lottery winning tickets from, from next month. Right. <laughs> you, you can do that. Right. Yeah. Um, but hopefully, uh, to, to make things simple, in simple terms that, that we all understand, um, if this were a real balance beam, a physical object, it cannot deflect instantaneously. It's got mass, it's got momentum, it's got molecules. Like when the ball hits mm. over here at B1, it's going to start deflecting at that point. Mm -hmm. and, you know, one molecule pushes another molecule, pushes another molecule, and it'll take a while before that travels as a wave through the material to get to the other side. And if, if you doubt that, I, I, can, I would have you consider earthquakes. Right? I live in California, so I'm very familiar with earthquakes. They don't travel through the rock instantaneously. We've all seen that, right? We've seen how the S wave, in this case it's an mm. S wave, um, travels through solid rock as a wave, and it takes time for it to travel. Um, and if we remember that our, our observer here is moving at half the speed of light, um, our observer is going to zip past this balance beam before any deflection even begins on this thing. Uh, but again, this is a very common mistake. Uh, all right. So, again, the reason this part was cut out of the email, right? The reason that this part was, I mean, was cut out of the of I Can Science That's presentation was because it gives context to the actual issue that the events are simultaneous regardless of the velocity of the observer and the apparent effect that one happened before the other. In reality, if you drop two, two of these on a balance beam and they don't hit simultaneously, there's going to be a deviation. I don't need this to travel faster than light to make the point, dude. Yet, again, you don't understand you 
cut out the full context so that you could keep it confined to this so that you could straw man it and beat it down. You didn't beat it down, buddy. You have to contend with what Einstein stated here. He knew what he was answering. Do you think he made a mistake when he said, are two strokes of lightning A and B, which are simultaneous with reference frame to the embankment, also simultaneous in the reference frame of the moving train? We shall show directly that the answer must be in the negative. Oh, no way. And then not even, dude. So this is the most egregious part. Well, not the most egregious part. That was all egregious. But to follow this up, because this is the end that's of it right here. So, yeah, and okay. Just cool fantastic so they go on to not address anything after what i said as well because if you guys remember from when you if you watched the full presentation here that i did i start talking about how gps doesn't account for any relativistic effects and it's also synced to galilean transformations which means absolute time and space none of this was addressed right Go over my boy Carol Alley over here talking about, hey, man, Lorentz physics doesn't exist in GPS or, or relativity of simultaneity. And I think it should be. Thank you. You guys are pathetic. Blitz, you, you're not catching a stray here, buddy. You didn't have anything to do with it. So this is all directed at I can science that and McToon here who had full foreknowledge of what was what they were supposed to address and how they were supposed to address it. And they didn't, they revealed their cowardice. So the balance beam has gone unrefuted and relativity of simultaneity does not exist. There are no implications based on the constancy of C. C is measured as C plus or minus V relative to the velocity of the observer. And this is, this is how GPS works. Otherwise, they'd have to account for relativity of simultaneity and up their Lorentz transformation game, but they don't. And then here we are in, what was this one? Where's the, where did I go over? Oh, right here, where I go over Neil Ashby. So that first paper was in, so the first paper quoted Carol Alley was in 1979. And then later on in 1996, he's like, hey man, I thought we were going to put relativity in GPS, but we're not. We still haven't done it yet. I think it should be in there. Thank you. And then here we have in the 2000s, we have Neil Ashby, who is a GPS expert, went around the world telling everyone that GPS is proof of relativity and the Sagnac effect is a relativistic effect, et cetera, et cetera. It's definitely not a relativistic effect. Otherwise, they would use Lorentz transformations for it. But anyway, I digress. GPS, the ECI and ECF frame, are transformed using absolute time and space right here. This is an absolute uh, time transformation right here. This is a Galilean transformation, not a relativistic one. Relativity does not exist. And you guys are trying so hard to protect it. And not even McToon, right? I don't expect McToon to defend it. He's not an academically credentialed. He'll follow anything these two dudes say, which is fine. Well, you know, not sound really fine, but this guy, I expected way more out of you, and I'm very disappointed. All right, that's the end of this video. Have a good day, sir. And if you ever want to accept that challenge, feel free to do so. No, I won't be coming onto your show to discuss this with you. If you want to defend it, you can do it live with a moderator.